It's always a pleasure to host a debate with luminaries in a public forum like this. One often finds oneself uh, speaking to these gentlemen, distinguished as they are, through uh, VSATs and all sorts of other recording equipment where you can't see them face to face. But it's very nice to be here amongst all of you, an appreciative crowd. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together for all the gentlemen who've made it here. And without any delay, let me begin this conversation. Who suppressed the Indic view is the title of our debate. And we are speaking on a day when India is marking Lachit Day. Lachit Bodh Pukan stalled the advance of uh, the Mughal invasion, so to speak, into the east. Some people might chafe at my use of the word invasion. But nonetheless, some of the advertisements celebrating or marking Lachit Day very candidly refer to it as an invasion. So I'm only taking the liberty of quoting that particular word. But why haven't we heard about Lachit Bodh Pokan? I'm sure if I were to do a quick head count here, a straw poll, a lot of people won't even know who we are talking about. Am I right? I can't hear you. Am I right? Yes, is the overwhelming response. In fact, many would say, that no one here would be surprised because large swaths of our culture, history, have been virtually overlooked, if not blacked out. Why? Was this deliberate? If so, who is to blame and why? And let me begin with Dr. Vikram Sampath and throw this question to you. Thank you, Rahul. A very good evening to all of you, all my esteemed co-panelists. It's a great honor and pleasure to share space with all of you. I think it's very appropriate, Rahul, that you brought up the right at the start, Lachit Borphukon and the Lachit Divas that is being organized. Uh, I mean, the political considerations apart. The very fact that this was that part of India which all the time resisted any kind of imperialist uh, you know, invasions, whether it was of the Afghans, the Mughals, uh, whoever came in, they were never able to occupy this place beyond a couple of years. The spirit of resilience, the spirit of courage, of battle, of, uh, you know, that military spirit ensured uh, that Kamrupa was kept free from all this influence. Uh, but the poll that you conducted also showed that people don't know about it. So why don't they know about it? Because we were not told about it. Uh, every student of Indian history, perhaps by rote, knows the long laundry list of battles that we lost as a nation, uh, from the Battle of Tarain, the battles of Panipat, the Anglo-Maratha, Anglo-Sikh, Anglo-Mysore Wars, uh, you name it, Battle of Baksar, Battle of Plassey, but the Battle of Saraighat, where Lachit actually won, would not be a part of uh, our growing up years. Uh, forget Assam, go deep down south to Kerala, the Battle of Kolachal. Uh, here was a time when Marthanda Verma of Travancore uh, managed to defeat the Dutch East India Company, a company which was having its global access of power from South Africa all the way to Japan uh, with a large part of India under its control. And Marthanda Verma uh, dealt a death blow to the Dutch East India Company and their imperialist designs in India as well. In any other country, Battle of Kolachal or the statues of Martha and Varma would be installed in every uh, square and commemorated. But in our country, I think this whole idea of particularly the way we look at our past and history with a sense of self-loathing, with that sense of apologia, I think that's been something that's, uh, that's uh, hand down from our colonial masters, perfected after independence by what is commonly known as the Nehruvian consensus where I think even Nehru's most sympathetic biographer, S. Gopal, had said that his assessment of the so-called minority issue was not what the majority uh, you know, thought about, but what the minority feels. And so even on vexatious issues like, say, the Somnath Mandir and so on, uh, Pandit Nehru would perhaps rather have that structure been uh, you know, resurrected and handed over to the ASI but not make it a living monument. So, you know, this whole obsession of, 
you know, you have to cut away from your past, the tenuous relation that exists with your past, and then make it in such a way that it's a fossilized monument in a museum, not a living tradition. Uh, that sadly has been the bane of at least Indian historiography. I know this session is not only about history, but different aspects of what that Indic view is. But history, I think, informs and instructs a large part of that view. But in that uh, you know, narrative, especially post-independence, an ideologically tainted uh, you know, narrative as well, political and ideological combination, I think we have uh, given up these legitimate sense of pride that we need to have in our past. I must stress here that there's a very thin, slippery slope between jingoism and pride. But then every nation, and history is the tool where you can recognize yourself as a people, as a civilization, as a society. So history does have that utility of wanting to create that sense of genuine pride about your past, your ancestors, their achievements, which unfortunately in this, what will they think, what will he think, what will, how will it affect today's uh, society, today's politics, I think at that altar of political correctness, at the altar of uh, political calculations and machinations, we have unfortunately uh, made Indian history, uh, you know, the scapegoat, and generations therefore have grown up deracinated. Uh, we don't take pride in our own achievements. There is a spectacular disconnect uh, with our past, and that's almost held up as a trophy, uh, as a sense of pride, a complete erasure of the Indic achievements in various fields, be it philosophy, sciences, medicine, mathematics, uh, architecture, you name it. Why does all of this not form part of our growing up years, our education? What is that unique Indic or Indian Bharatiya perspective which our children are never learning? Why are we so besotted by the Western model? Well, you've uh, identified who should actually carry the blame and you seem to suggest it's the Nehruvian consensus but why? That part of the question, you haven't answered. So why would a nation awaking to life and freedom not want to celebrate its past, its civilizational history? Along with celebration, Rahul, I think comes a lot of the darker aspects too of our past, which in the years, I think, you know, uh, being fair uh, to the people who uh, handled this country or got this country at a very dif difficult juncture. There was the scourge of partition, millions were displaced, millions, uh, you know, lost their lives and homes. Uh, in an earlier discussion with another, uh, you know, erudite politician, uh, you know, he literally gave it up by saying, we use history as a tool for nation building. Uh, and when history is em employed for such a task, uh, for nation building, for creating trust, so to say, between communities who have just come out of the scourge of a bloody partition, uh, the need is felt that uncomfortable truths should not be spoken because somehow someone is going to feel bad or it's going to demonize a group or it's going to make, uh, you know, contemporary society, uh, you know, feel offended. But dare I say that, you know, the edifice of national unity uh, or this imagined edifice of national unity cannot rest on the shaky foundations of fabricated history. Uh, because fabrication can last only for that much time, as and how more truth emerges, light is the best disinfectant, more truth emerges, more people are going to question the fabrication that has been done willfully over so many generations. And at that time, social cohesion, which was your goal objective, that is going to go for a toss because people are going to, uh, you know, question the status quo and there's going to be unrest and anarchy, which is what we are seeing manifesting all the time. All our wars today on news channels, on, uh, for, between politicians is on matters of the 17th century, 18th century. Sometimes I wonder, are Aurangzeb, Tipu Sultan, are these people running elections these days? Because most of our valuable public time is spent only discussing all these people. And that's because we haven't made peace with our past. Tell the truth as it is. Be honest with the past, stare it in the face, and get done with it. I think we've had a very, very troubled history. Uh, subterfuge, fabrication, whitewashing, uh, with some imagined objective of today's social unity is not going to help a country as diverse and pluralistic as India. Let's make peace with it. Let us heal a truth and reconciliation of sorts as a society, and then move on and build a better future. Mr. Kushi, let me bring you into this. What Dr. Sampath seems to suggest is that we try to overcompensate. 
And we built this edifice of the Nehruvian consensus on a political correctness which erred on the side of distorting our history. In political terms, we have been hearing the BJP use the term appeasement politics. Is that the reason that a particular age Congress party indulged a particular community to such an extent that uh, we decided to eviscerate from our history certain inconvenient facts. Do you think that's the problem here? Dr. Sampath seems to suggest that. Why? Well, uh, there are many things that Dr. Sampath has said that I cannot possibly, possibly have a disagreement with. But uh, there are certain conclusions that, that uh, I find perplexing. Uh, Nehru didn't tell anybody to write a particular kind of history. There were some very eminent historians. Don't write them off. Some very eminent historians didn't belong to a particular community, didn't, didn't, have, a, didn't have a political ambition, uh, who were just very good professional historians, who had understood certain perspectives, presented them, uh, questioned many issues, questioned many issues, presented them. And to say that there was a wholesale falsification of the truth, I think is a, is a bit of an exaggeration. It may be something that may be happening today. So having said that there is, there is a bottom layer of truth in what he has said, and I don't think the Congress party or the Nehruvian consensus ever questioned that. If anything, as I understand, the Nehruvian consensus gently moved to ensure that all of that was uncovered and highlighted or underscored. And I don't think the issue of, of, uh, of appeasement should come here. But we must remember one thing. There was ancient India and a fantastic amount of scholarship and a fantastic amount of material that ancient India provides in which we are all proud. It doesn't belong to a polit polit political party or a movement. It, is, it belongs to the people of India and we are all proud of it. But then that was, that was ancient India described in one manner or another, but ancient India. Then there was medieval India. Medieval, medieval India, there may be dimensions of medieval India that people may have specific uh, disputes with. Uh, you call something an invasion or you call something a migration. Uh, it's happened in the world. Nothing is static and nothing can be static and nothing can be returned in time. Things move on and they moved on. They moved on to medieval India and much was added to this fantastic culture in this country by the period of medieval India. And I think it will be unfair to say that medieval India m sort of merges into modern India and modern India also provided us with many things that even the medieval, medieval India would not have agreed with, but provided many things that today we, the fact that you and I and we all of us here are discussing this very critical issue in the English language is what was provided by modern India. This is not something that we created. This is something that emerged out of an experience that we had, an experience that we perhaps should say we shouldn't have had. We shouldn't have been subjugated. Of course we shouldn't have been subjugated. The problem will be that the line of subjugation will probably be drawn somewhere else by some people and somewhere else by us. That's the difference. But we should really celebrate what we are today. We have everything. And if somebody feels that a particular individual idea, concept, or a movement has not got its share, well, we should give it. Who stops you? We must give it. We must be proud. But the pride must lie in the entire population of our country and not in somebody who thinks that he is a savior of that idea. A, a quick counter to you on this. You said that what might be happening today is falsification. And you said that you can't really blame Nehru. He didn't force a particular view upon us. This was the work of eminent historians, eminent Greece, in a way of saying. 
But today, when someone wants to redirect our history in our textbooks, it is not seen as the work of eminent historians like Dr. Sampath, but it is seen as the work of a government and a prime minister who might be trying to well, I mean, re that rework. That may be your impression, but... But that's what I, you said. No, 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 I didn't say that. So you discussed Nehru from... Wait a minute. Let's, let's just be clear about the rules. Okay. I think Dr. Sampath has done a fantastic, fantastic research, and he's provided a fantastic material to modern India. He has. He's not done it on, on the instructions of a government. He's not done it on the payment of a government. He's done it because he actually genuinely believes in it. Now, what he believes in it has quality and caliber. I may not agree with the conclusions, but then he may not agree with my conclusions. So a government, does it have the right to incorporate his scholarship into a modern syllabus, or would Rahul Gandhi and others in the Congress party, just as an example, say a coward is being given a pedestal in our history books when he doesn't deserve to be? I'm talking about Veer Savar. Surely, surely there is nothing about our precepts and our beliefs that says that one person called Rahul Gandhi does not have the right to say anything about the syllabus. Sure. Shows. Let everybody say everything about the syllabus. And that's what democracy is about. And maybe, maybe it's a good thing to have both sides in the syllabus so that people can judge for themselves as to what they are. But I do not speak either for Mr. Rahul Gandhi or for Mr. Nehru or for anybody else because I believe we are here to discuss the pure ideas, pure ideas. And I've said that many of those pure ideas are ideas that I respect. I'm happy to be proud of those ideas, but not to the exception of other ideas that I'm also proud of. Let me bring in Mr. Jaisai Deepak, because a divergence was made between Nehru and the work of historians. Though Nehru had a deep antipathy towards Dr. Rajendra Prasad's proposal to go and inaugurate or reconstruct the Somnath Temple. In a sense, as Dr. Sampath says, <laughs> fossilize its rebirth or renaissance, or reconstruction or what have you. How would that not have influenced the historians of the time or the makers of the syllabus of the time? Do you agree with this or do you just believe that this was accidental? Some great minds worked and they came up with textbooks and they said it as it was. I don't think it's that innocent. I'll give you perhaps a nugget. So, Roshan Seth, the actor, plays Nehru in Bharat Ek Khosh. And in the episode that speaks of Prithviraj Chauhan, it ends with a reference to Prithviraj Raso, which speaks of how Ghori was killed by a blinded Prithviraj Chauhan. And that's how that particular story ends. But Nehru's comment with respect to that particular ending is, this is perhaps make-believe. And I don't think this would have been the case. And that perhaps a defeated people are trying to invent fables and legends to assuage or mollify their own defeated sentiments. That seems to be the running train of Nehruvian thought across his works. And this is not, let's say, a sample position that you take out of context. This is his running thought. Now, I would agree with Mr. Kurshid, if assume for a moment, two sets of scholars with divergent opinions were equally patronized for their positions and scholarship. And then the public had an opportunity to consume both points of view and to determine which of these is more evidence-based, which of these is more consistent with the immediate incident of the partition or the ghastly episode of the partition, and which of these is more believable? What is it that we would like to draw lessons from? Now, it so happens that a particular line of historians were completely kept outside the pale of the establishment. R.C. Majumdar, Jadunath Sakkar, all of these people who were comfortable presenting uncomfortable truths were relegated to the margins. So therefore, it's not as if all, politi all historians who were willing to present a certain point of view were given an opportunity. So I'm not willing to buy that. Second, assume for a moment that the ghastly specter of partition hadn't taken place and we were still living in an undivided united India, I would still buy the premise to some extent that why would you want to dig up an uncomfortable past when somehow after a thousand years of bloodshed, two major communities have managed to find peace to live with each other alongside each other as part of a single nation. 
But after the partition, on the basis of a two-nation theory, which clearly has a religious basis, what mythical unity are you trying to build and what mythical peace are you trying to build after millions of people have already lost their lives and Bharat has lost about 30% of its land, so to speak, at the very least. So what is this unity that you're trying to build on the altar of falsified history? I can understand that there's an incentive to build this unity and this, this peace-building initiative provided the partition hadn't taken place. But after the partition, at the very least, the government has an obligation to place historical facts, allow people to come forward and say that this is what has happened, there is a continuum as far as this particular mindset is concerned, and there cannot be a repeat of this particular mindset for the benefit of our own people. Now, I am not willing for a moment to buy the fact that the exodus, the forced exodus of Kashmiri pundits from Kashmir has nothing to do with the mindset that resulted in the partition. I am unable to buy that particular fact. Therefore, this is not an archival study in the past. It is as much a study of an ongoing present which is going to repeat itself or at least at the very least is repeating itself across several parts of the country. Therefore, I don't think history is merely a question of looking back, learning certain lessons and moving forward. Because if, to, if it were that easy, why would you have placards with respect to Aryan invasion theory at every protest relating to a reservation? So history remains relevant to every contemporary discussion, unfortunately or fortunately so. Then we might as well ensure that there is a plurality of voices. So here's one suggestion that I make. And this is on the basis of my discussion with several historians. And I hope uh, Vikram Sampath, Dr. Vikram Sampath weighs in on this. Perhaps history should be taken away from the realm of the government altogether. And let there be a body of independent experts who are in a position to arrive at some kind of consensus with respect to what kind of curriculum needs to be presented in school syllabi. This happens in other countries. We seem to be learning the worst of principles from the West. But the best of principles also means independent actors and independent experts on subject matter, they come together and they formulate the study. And people's parents are invited for their inputs on whether you want this particular thing to be presented as school curriculum, so on and so forth. That's a suggestion that's possible. But you see, the so-called non-left in this country would still be comfortable with that particular suggestion. But those who believe that history needs to be utilized to perpetuate a particular myth about this particular country as a defeated society and as a defeated nation would never want to let go of any kind of control over history as a domain and humanities as a domain. That's been the reality. As someone who has spent a significant amount of time talking to students across campuses in several lectures, this much I can vouch for a fact that history is a real battleground. And that means it translates to policy making, it translates to curriculum, it translates to legal education, it translates to all kinds of submissions being made even before the Supreme Court of the land. I'm sure you followed the arguments that were presented as part of the EWS case before the Supreme Court. I would say that was a textbook instance of Nehruvian distorted history being mainstreamed through arguments before the highest court of the land. And I was very happy that people could finally see what kind of versions of history are, have actually been bought lock, stock and barrel by members of the establishment, so the so-called Nehruvian establishment and what is being presented to oppose the EWS. I'm not on the question of EWS, but on how history was weaponized in the Supreme Court during the course of a policy discussion. So I'm very clear that history is never going to be free of contestation. I'm only hoping that people have the courage of their conviction and the honesty to wear their biases on their sleeve and allow the evidence to speak for itself so that the public can ask itself whether the bias prevails over the evidence or the evidence prevails over the bias. That's something for people to decide. That's what I'm here for. Mr. Verma, Mr. Kurshid mentioned the necessity of including everyone's narratives, and I think there JSI Deepak would agree that let's have an honest review and include everyone's point of view and then come out with perhaps a version of history. Unfortunately, there are a large number of people who say today that that is not happening. Certain versions are being excluded or will be excluded in the project to perhaps correct some of these omissions that we are discussing here. But I just want you to uh, quote, I just want you to listen to this because this is a bit of a quote. There is a difference, for instance, Mohan Bhagwat has himself said, we accept Akbar, but we cannot accept Aurangzeb. He talked about Dara Shiko as someone who had to be admired. What is wrong with that, fundamentally? That doesn't seem to suggest that a particular school that might be in power today 
is looking to exclude the other side from the conversation or from the annotation of history. You see, though, I've listened patiently to very learned people. Let me give you my view, and since I have spoken last, just allow me to finish. Absolutely. You see, history is never entirely objective because people write it and people write it out of experiences that they feel either need to be included or excluded. Now, India's history is one where there are four Indic religions, one, some of the greatest religions of the world, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, which were born in this land. Now, it's not been a continuous and linear evolution of the Indic faiths which were hyphenated within Indic culture. There were severe setbacks to this Indic civilization and which will explain to you why perhaps after 1947 we have not been able to resurrect many aspects that are valuable in such a rich legacy. First, we had the Turkic Islamic invasion. And I have argued in my book, The Great Hindu Civilization, that we cannot gloss over the facts of history. It was, as uh, Will Durant said, one of the bloodiest chapters in the history of the world. There was a great degree of destruction and damage to but in particular Hinduism, because Buddhism had partly migrated out of India by that time, to Hinduism, its temples, its artifacts, and its centers of learning. The, there are two great achievements in spite of that attack. One is that Hinduism survived because it's a Sanatan religion. It reinvented itself, particularly through the Bhakti movement, where it took religion itself to the masses in their own language. And it survived. Secondly, in spite of that attack, we built what I consider an extremely valuable part of our heritage, which is what we call the Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb, where we included in a syncretic manner the influences that have come in in the cultural, philosophical, literary parts of our life. Now, the second aspect of his, of that followed after Islam was the British conquest. I think the British conquest was even more lethal in somehow uh, downplaying the Indic legacy because the success of British colonialism was not our physical subjugation. It was the colonization of our mind. We began to look with hinta, with a sense of inferiority, with a sense of criticism at our own culture and legacy of the past. I mean, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, for instance, for whom I have great admiration otherwise, actually wrote to the British saying that this entire Sanskrit legacy is wallowing in the past and we need to adopt Western education in total. This is what it did to intelligent Indians about their own Indic legacy. Now, the last factor which is important, is what happened after 1947. And I want to say to you, you see, colonialism, its cultural impact takes decades to go. With political independence, we got freedom. But the impact of colonialism on our minds has still not gone. I mean, Salman mentioned the fact that one of the great consequences and he said it, I thought, positively, is that we are speaking in English. Frankly, I am not very proud of the fact that we are speaking in English. We are a country with one of the richest linguistic heritages in the world. 24 languages with their own corpus, with their own vocabulary, with their own script. But still, the first thing the colonizers do is to take away your language. Now, what is my last point? My last point is that as a consequence of colonialism, some of those who inherited power, you were talking about, you were discussing Nehru, some of those who inherited power after 1947 continued to in, 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 imbibe the colonial bias that everything about our past 
was in the words of Jawaharlal Nehru, for whom otherwise I have great respect, the dead wood of the past. It was superstition, it was prejudice, it was ritual. And the attempt was to define modernity purely in a western paradigm. And a great deal was lost because we did not apply ourselves to resurrecting, recreating, uh, reappropriating aspects of this Indic legacy and that is where history was also distorted because an attempt was made as I think Sai Deepak said or uh, Vikram that in the aftermath of partition let's not play up the truths about history and try to gloss them over but it became a very powerful school and it was bound to create a backlash because you must accept truth and Vikram mentioned that the truth and reconciliation machine. We need to accept that truth. But where I disagree is, and final point, is that you cannot excavate the acrimonies of the past today when we are a modern republic where we are moving and we have recognized ourselves to be a multilingual, multicultural, multi-religious, plural state in accordance with a great Indic legacy. Ekam Satya Vipraha Bahuda Vadanti. There are many versions to the truth and we in this republic have recognized them and resolved to become a nation which is plural, which accepts diversity and which has moved forward in spite of what people consider to be a debilitating diversity. That's our achievement. So let's put a halt there. And I finally have a little difference with Sai Deepak when he says that the partition was meant to create a final divide between Hindus and Muslims. I have only contempt for what happened in Pakistan to Hindus. But many Muslims stayed behind here out of choice. And they were born and are part of this soil. In fact, the whole premise of India is that it is not Pakistan. And therefore, I believe we need to recognize this, accept the facts of history, and re 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 reappropriate our history. What has been done? I ask you since 47. Even the history textbooks have not been changed. Rasa, the theory of aesthetics we were talking about, was written by Bharat in the Natya Shastra 400 years before the birth of Christ. It's an entire chapter, chapter which is a meditation on aesthetics. When people had not come down from trees in most parts of the world. And we buy the western conceit that aesthetics was a word discovered in the 17th century. Why is it not taught in our textbooks? Why are aspects of the Bhagavad Gita, if we exclude the religious part, where there is a secular message, where the Bhagavad Gita talks about Nishkam Karm, which is a voltage stabilizer in the stress lives we lead, not part of our educational curriculum. Why do our views on history become so north-centric? We have every street named after the Mughal emperor and I believe they are an important part of our history. What about others? Where is there a boulevard in Delhi on Krishna Devaraya? The great Vijayanagar king who is comparable to Akbar and Ashok by the way. Where is the street after Raja Raj Chola? So I think we, we have not corrected that history and no, made no systematic sustained effort to once again reappropriate our culture. The budget of the Ministry of Culture, even after 2014 by a government that came with the idea of restoring India's cultural pride, is cut every year. The budget of the Ministry of Education is cut. The educational curriculum has been tinkered with, not changed. I know it's a sensitive project, but the attempt at least needs to be made. We haven't done it. So there is no point blaming somebody else. This is very interesting. And J. Sai Deepak, let me come back to you. There's a fine line between excavating the truth about the past and the acrimonies of the past. That's the distinction that he's playing on. Is that what's happening? Did Dr. Sampath, when he wrote about Veer Savarkar, excavate the acrimonies of the past or was he excavating the truth about the past? So as someone who comes from the south, the southern meal starts with the sweet. So let me start with a point of agreement with Mr. Varma. 
on the aspect of colonization and on the impact of colonization, I don't think I have anything to disagree with at all. That it has much more pernicious and far more, let's say, far-reaching effects than the use of the sword. I completely agree with on that. And I think we are still reeling from the impact of it, which is very clear. I don't think we are wearing the Mughal clothes. We are wearing the clothes of the British man, for all practical purposes, at least some of us. So therefore, I understand that particular issue. But this much is clear from the points made by Mr. Khurshid and Mr. Varma, that one believes that that was a wave of migration, and the other is clear, citing material, that this was not a migration. This was a bloody invasion, as bloody as it could get in the history of humankind. Now, this is what I wish to highlight to make one point. To choose to, make, uh, to, choose to observe a strategic silence in the interest of peace is very different from actively indulging in denial of history. And that's exactly where the problem starts. <coughs> so if an entire school is established that goes about whitewashing stuff as opposed to saying, let's not touch this particular aspect of history, which I think is also not possible. How do you choose to remain silent over one particular aspect of your history? That's not going to happen. So then the only option is to speak about it. Now, why should this, the discussion with respect to something that has happened in the past result in acrimony in the present unless someone relates to the invader even in the present and someone does not relate to the invader even in the present? In which case, the two-nation theory is well alive and kicking. That's one. But factually speaking, one particular trope I think needs to be busted because I think it's been sold well beyond its sell-by date. I'm sorry to say, after partition, people did not choose to stay here. The elections prior to the partition of 1946 spoke volumes. And that's a very clear decision taken at the ballot. And therefore, when you choose to speak about history, let's be clear that perhaps practical considerations came into existence which prevented a mass migration, but certainly not patriotic considerations or Bharatiya considerations. I think that myth needs to be busted. And we cannot sell it any further. Three. On Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, well, while I have several reservations with Dr. Ambedkar, the one thing that he was crystal clear about in his book, Pakistan and the Partition of India, which was published on the eve of the partition, two books were published by Rajendra Prasad in 1946 and Dr. Ambedkar in 1946, <coughs> in which he clearly says that the so-called Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, or the syncretic culture that is celebrated over and over again, is a product of the incomplete conversion of the converted Hindu to Islam. And therefore, multiple waves of attempts have been made on a regular basis to remove the, re the remnants of that Hinduness from that particular convert, which is what has been pushed in this country as what we know as Wahhabism. To say that the new convert shall identify himself with the early, early converts to Islam and therefore, you cannot have any, any ties whatsoever or any cultural practices whatsoever which remind you of your ancestor. That starts with the language, that moves to dressing, so on and so forth. So let's be clear. If acrimony is the result or is going to be the result of a discussion with respect to the medieval period in current day Bharat and contemporary Bharat, that is because there are still people who relate to this particular person or this particular period. Had that not been the case, why should there be a resistance with respect to the rec reclamation of a particular, uh, let's say, structure that was built by an invader? Whether it's Babri Masjid or Gyanwapi Mandir or so on and so forth, these were built by invaders. Obviously, they were not built after the independence of this particular country. This is not a structure that has come into existence after 15th of August 1947. Why do you relate to this particular structure? Because the mindset that has been imposed on you at the peril of the sword and, at, at, uh, let's say, at the pain of death prevents you from accepting your past and therefore it's going to be a constant tussle each time there's a discussion with respect to the past. So I refuse to buy the fact that history is no more relevant or that uh, it's possible for us to have these discussions objectively. I agree with Mr. Verma on this point. It cannot be objective. That's exactly why I concluded my first opening submission by saying all of us is, uh, have our biases. It's impossible for us to say that we don't have biases. We are human beings. Impossible. We may choose not to bring out certain proclivities and, let's say, ideological uh, leanings uh, to the fore for reasons of pragmatism, whatever it may be. But let the evidence speak for itself. But if the evidence leads to a different conclusion and it has consequences on the street or elsewhere, 
then the people who choose to resort to the street merely because truth is being presented in a public forum are to be blamed, history is not to be blamed, and certainly not those people who wish to present that version of history before the public. Mr. Kushid, there seems to be an impression that has sought to be created that the onus of presenting history in a convenient light to keep the peace, so to speak, is only on one community and not the other. And when history is brought out, you might have people who say, oh, well, this is being presented in an acrimonious manner. I think what J. Sai Deepak seems to be suggesting is that the other side, in this case, perhaps, if you look at medieval history, our minorities, our Muslims must accept certain new facts and not resent the new history as some huge imposition of a particular worldview which will lead to the crowding out of either their history or their faith. Well, I, uh, I, I can't imagine that uh, such a historical debate can end here in the time that you have given. Um, but there are some fundamental issues. When we think of India and we tell ourselves what India means to us and what we see uh, our, our part in India, there will be some fundamental rules that we will have to agree upon. Now, if he sits here and says, I am a progeny of an invader, there is no conversation. Now, how much do you want to dig out of the past? I know that when things change, when ages pass, accommodations have to be, be made. I am not saying that whatever you are doing to X, Y, and Z is completely unacceptable. I'm not stupid to say that we will wait a thousand years to reverse this. There is a progressive movement forward. And I think that the manner in which one should accept it is to say that, look, there was a sense of deprivation, a sense of, a sense of denial that has today been corrected in whichever manner. Let's accept it and move forward. You have to do something on that moment when you come together as a nation. Otherwise, you're not a nation. You're just, just put together by circumstances, and you're just waiting for something to happen so that you can, you can uh, blow apart once again. Can't be. You have to accept some fundamental rules. And the fundamental rules are not about falsifying history or suppressing a particular historical perspective or refusing to accept anything you say as having any virtue. No. But the moment you say you are an invader, then you are talking to an invader. You are not talking to one of your own. You have already rejected that person as one of your own. We don't reject you. You reject us. Cannot then be the making of a nation. Whatever else you want to go into, but the making of a nation was a compact that we came together to say, this is the country we will build together. And of course, some people will have to sacrifice, some people, some people have to accommodate, some people have to adjust. But this is not the language of building a country. This is a language of making a point that I want a country that existed 5,000 years ago. What are you doing here? Sorry, not acceptable. Dr. Sampath, how do you view this? Because you've written histories. Do you find an attempt being even made to understand where you're coming from? Uh, you were mentioning an incident <coughs> at a uh, festival some time back where you were shouted down, etc., etc. That's not the approach either. I don't think you are revisiting some of our histories to paint uh, uh, an acrimonious picture of interfaith relations, neither are you suggesting, correct me if I'm wrong, that the inheritors of that history should be punished today for what certain ancestors did. Is that, no. is, I mean, if one were to accept what Mr. Kurshid is no, saying. not at all. I think uh, the, the dire need, and I think I uh, would like to address the point Dr. Mr. Kurshid made, that the converse is actually true in my, uh, my view, that hyphenating today's communities, 
specifically today's Muslims, the albatross of Ghazni and Ghori and Aurangzeb and Tipu does not lie on any of their shoulders. A young Muslim man or woman is not responsible for them. But on the converse, by trying to whitewash and erase these, uh, these excesses committed by these invaders, somewhere the policy makers in the last 70 years, perhaps, knowingly or unknowingly, have tried to tell them that if we talk about this, you are going to feel uh, you know, offended. So why are you hyphenating them with these invaders in the first place? It's the, the, the uh, boot is on the other foot. Now, when we talk of the excesses of the East India Company, no one is worrying that the Christians of India are going to get offended. We very openly talk, Dr. Shashi Tharoor has written an entire classic on the inglorious empire. But why not something on the Islamic conquest of India, uh, as Will Durant had mentioned? There, why does this uh, thought come that it's going to make someone feel uncomfortable? So by doing that, sub subconsciously and subliminally, somewhere the people on, the, on a certain ideological disposition have already put that albatross on the uh, shoulders of uh, a, a particular community. And if, first of all, you don't need members of one religion as icons for that religion. Uh, a, a Hindu, a Parsi, a Jain, or whatever can be an icon even for a Muslim boy or girl. Uh, you don't have to make Aurangzeb look secular. Uh, there, are, there are crazy uh, people who also say he protected more temples than he uh, you know, destroyed them. Uh, just like probably Hitler would have probably murdered lesser Jews uh, than he could have. Uh, but then why do you have to do all that to ensure that, you know, that community finds an icon? In, uh, in my state, Karnataka, Tipu Sultan is today uh, made almost like this symbol or an icon of a particular community. Whereas there are living memories of uh, hatred against him beyond politics and political parties among the Kodavas, among the Mangalore uh, Christians, Syrian Christians, the Catholics, the Nayars of Malabar, the Mandiam Ayangars, all of them, which is as much living history. So I think uh, this dehyphenation is most important. You don't need members of the same community as icons for them. Even if you need that, you may have syncretic examples of a Dara Shikor or, uh, you know, Ras Khan or uh, Rahim and so on, whom you can draw rather than do this subterfuge that, you know, whitewash these crimes. And that, I think, so actually the, uh, the, the, the argument is on the other side than what Mr. Khurshid made, in my view. Very quickly, yes, Mr. Varma. I just want to say, since the time is short and probably this is a concluding comment, that we need to be honest about our past. But equally, we need maturity, wisdom, inclusion, and reconciliation today. I genuinely say that because I think we will be violating one of the strongest tenet of Indic faiths, which is that this world is one of inclusion. I mean, the Mahavakya is Vasudev Kutumbuka. Ano Bhadra Kritavo Yantu Vishwita, let good thoughts flow from all directions. Let us not attack the Indic faiths by making them clones of what has happened to theocratic states elsewhere. That takes away the unique distinction of India, which is a plural republic. And I want to say that somewhere what the comments made, I think there is a feeling that all Hindus hate Muslims and Muslims hate Hindus and that they can never be part of one syncretic culture. I don't believe it's true because if it was true, a party which was speaking, let us say disproportionately or only for Hindus, would have won every election. But our surveys show that even in the moments of the maximum polarization on the basis of religion, post Godra, Babri Masjid, or most recently in West Bengal, the elections. Not more than 50% Hindus vote only because they are Hindus. So there is already in our DNA a sense of an inclusive republic. Okay. And let us keep it like that. I'm reminded, although I'm reluctant to say it, Sai, of Rahat Indori's line, Sabhi ka khun shamil hai yahaan ki mitti mein. Kisi ke baap ka Hindustan thodi hai. Can I just make one point? Okay, just one, okay point. one final, two closing comments. Okay. I'm happy that Mr. Varma deemed it fit to point out that the Hindu never always votes as a Hindu. And somehow he didn't deem it fit to give the very same example with respect to others. Now I leave that decision to him. See, the point is this. 
you have two variables in the equation, facts and tone. Let us present facts, but not necessarily in a violent tone. My submission is this. Do not create, let's say, ghosts. To prevent the presentation of facts, the focus of the law, even when facts is presented before the public platform, is in what tone is a particular fact presented. Because if it is grating, then the tone alone is sufficient for invoking the law. So therefore, I am saying let the tone be peaceful. Let the tone be one of reconciliation. But let there be no compromise on facts. As long as we agree on that, I think there's a meeting ground to be met. Final word. I think that's a fair point. And, uh, you know, in our earlier discussion, I just agree. one line on what uh, Mr. Verma said in one of your Converse, uh, you know, debates as well, Rahul. We had this conversation with Mr. Verma and me where, you know, he keeps invoking the, uh, the, the Indic, you know, essence of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam and Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudhavadanti, which is true, which is the essence of this nation. But then also, Mr. Verma, there is a clash of ideas where on the one hand, there's one group which does talk about acceptance and inclusion of everything. And there is a, a clash with another worldview, another thought where it is my way or the highway, where there is, the, there is still thoughts of what is, in, what is infidelity, what is, uh, how that needs to be curved, why there needs to be, uh, you, know, um, you know, you need to convert people into your fold. If everybody is equal, if everybody is inclusive, there's no need for uh, these things beyond economic let, considerations. Let us strive for everyone to be inclusive. Okay, gentlemen and the audience, thank you very much for watching this. Very interesting conversation. It can't be accommodated in 35, 40 minutes. I'm sure, I'm sure this conversation will continue and that's really the positive aspect of it without acrimony. Thank you very much.